Hey, here we go. Okay. Hey, I'm on. I'm on. Yeah. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yay, I'm on. I cannot see you. Uh, I'll start. <laughs> there we go. All right. All right. There you are. Hey. All right. <laughs> I was worried. <laughs> hey, we're in the right spot. Okay, good. Yeah. Hey. Hello. It's still dark here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, where? Yeah, it's. Six o'clock in the morning. No, Alaska time. Alaska. Oh, that's right. Nice. Oh my gosh. It's six o'clock in the morning. Uh, dedication. Oh uh, yeah. My husband. My husband thinks it's quite funny. <laughs> so yeah. Wow, that's cool. That's okay. I got my coffee. <laughs> um, it's, I'm ready to go. <laughs> And remind me, are you are you at Amazing Grace? No, which one are you at? I'm at New Hope, North Pole. Oh, oh that's right. Mm. Yeah. Yes. North Pole. How could I forget? Yes. It's going yes. to be snowing here next week, a few days. Oh, wow. Accumulating snow. <laughs> so, yeah. We're ready. I don't have a picture yet. Oh, boy. But I'm here. Okay, so. This is like, who's, who's operating this one? Is it you? <laughs> Emily's going back there. Okay. So you'll like, you know how to break people in the groups and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there we go. We're getting there. Can you see us now? I you. could see. see well, you around up front. I can't see me. I can't see Brett, but I can see the room. Okay. We're getting there. Okay. Eh, uh, you don't want to see me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I'm awake. I'm awake. <laughs> oh. Okay, we have to find out why nobody else is awake down there. <laughs> yeah, no kidding here. <laughs> Well, I, I just saw a post on Facebook that someone was asking where the link is, and I think they were looking under week five, and it doesn't have anything. So I just no. week one and was like, yeah, yeah. That one. it's there. It was really, it was slow coming up today. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, quite slow. Yeah. Okay. Okay, what video, like, and they they'll, be, they'll be able to see the room though, right? Yes. Okay. okay. Did you guys happen to hear what Terry just said? Professor Elton? No. Okay. Um, basically, you guys are going to um, be able to see the classroom. Okay. And here, obviously, but we're not going to have, we're going to be doing chat board for our communication. Okay. So if you have questions or things that, you know, when she's asking for feedback from the class, you can enter it into the chat and I'll okay. be able to, to interject and raise my hand, et cetera. Gotcha. Okay. Or if we, if there is breaking into small groups, Terry, will we break them into rooms? Okay. Yeah, so we'll break you into rooms here on Zoom. And gotcha. Yep, then you can turn your audio on and have conversation with your classmates in small groups. Okay. I don't know how familiar you all are with Zoom. In some ways, we're just uh, newbies ourselves. We're rolling it out this fall. And it's created this possibility. In the past, we've used Adobe Connect, and we've had to do all of our communication with you all via chat room. And any small groups, I would just kind of be the moderator for that, for a large group of people. But now with Zoom, we're going to be able to put you into some small group conversations, which is really cool. So we'll get you broken off into those small groups when, when appropriate. Even in Alaska. <laughs> no, it worked, it worked last time. Yeah, where, where the, the sun, sun is not up. <laughs> nope, not yet. 
pretty soon you'll be looking at me and at 11 o'clock it'll be dark. Oh my goodness. So, oh, oh it's only, fine. it doesn't last long. Yeah. Last time, last time we had everybody up, but maybe it's just the connections. Okay. And then the PowerPoint. Now. now, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. That, so we want? I think so. Okay. Do I need a chat? <laughs> Yes. Um, and so Terry Wolf. All right, everybody. Pretty soon, uh, Emily is going to be muting all of us. So I'm going to just type in a, a greeting on the chat board. So if you want to reply after I do that, just so I can see who's here. <laughs> Carla, all right. Brian, thank you. And is it Michelle? No. There's Brett. And Micah. Great. Mm -hmm. In order to get through any readings, I like I have sunflower seeds. How's it going? <laughs> I'm just breaking. Hi, Erica. Good morning. Have a nice day. Yeah, and then they got all these. She's doing her girls. So, you think that, Erica? That's what you think. I need to and he even like took a piece of fabric and like like wrapped it around his shirt with the highlighters. And then he actually sat down and was like, "This way." I know. What time? What time is chapel today? What's a lot of work? Yeah, in Oxford. Oh, nice. That would be tragic. Exactly. I would be not, not even for the mess. I would be uncaffeinated <laughs> and I would probably just be sitting here crying for the next conversation. Then I might stop. <laughs> Classes today. Anybody? I have a laundry that goes next to me. Yeah. Oh, I like it a lot. Yeah. Okay. They like to beat off of each other.
I don't know. I don't know why I'm so behind. If I'm a robot, I don't mean to stay. It's a there was a few there were two and they weren't Oh, yeah, All right, let's get started. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, hey. hey, it sounds like they're wide awake in the back. That's good. <laughs> so good to see all of you on month two of the semester. You're still standing. Not, they're sitting. Or sitting, but you're, you're still alive, got a pulse, breathing, and we're so uh, delighted that you're here today as we continue this journey um, of Christian public leadership in uh, CPL 0501. This is, uh, in many ways, a time to get settled in the seminary life, to establish some rhythms. We know that we're not quite there yet, but you're going to continue to find those rhythms as we go throughout the semester. And uh, what a great collaborative effort it is for us as faculty and contextual learning to do this work together with all of you. And in fact, I just want to uh, briefly introduce one of our newest team members here. Erica Rosti Dolmer is with us. Let's give her a warm welcome. One of the things that we have discovered as we've continued to, to grow the curriculum around Christian public leader is it does have a lot of elements between the contextual work and all of the uh, learning agreements. Everybody familiar with those? <laughs> Got a deadline coming up here and the reflective assessments at the end of the semester or yesterday. And, or yesterday and some of the work that's gone on in between there and so erica is going to be working with us part-time in a lot of the administrative detail so you'll get to know her as she enters into this work with us and so welcome um, erica could erica put her face up by use of the app absolutely so see her face? yeah just so that erica's not just an email address to all of you face. online this is erica and right. so you're going to be able to get to know her and hopefully have some phone calls if you're from a distance. And when you're here for intensives, to so please stop <laughs> in to contextual learning and say hello. Um, she'll be here uh, often on Mondays when we have staff meetings and Thursdays as well. So with that, we are going to talk uh, more today, deepening the conversation from the learning pastoral imagination uh, research, some of that formative thing that you read early on last month about why do we do what we do in contextual learning and in theological education around wisdom and, and phronesis, this sense of putting it all together in a real practical wisdom for ministry. Today, we're going to uh, dive into thinking about what it means to be a reflective leader. And uh, Professor Elton has some great insights and even some tools for you to be considering as you enter into relationship with the people that you are doing ministry with. Um, and so we hope that that is a blessing for you. So as we do so, we'd like to open with a word of prayer today. The Lord be with you. Amen. Gracious God, we thank you for such a time like this, that we can have the privilege to come together to learn, uh, to discuss, to be mindful of your presence. You are Holy Spirit, paraclete, walking alongside, accompanying, opening our minds and a sense of curiosity for what you are up to in our midst and what you are doing out ahead of us. Fix our eyes on you. May we be ever mindful that you are present here in this room and that you are stimulating our intellect, our emotions, our spirit. You are truly present. And for this, we give you thanks. And may we throw ourselves into this learning today. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Professor Elton. Boom, <laughs> there right. you go. Well, good morning once again. Here's what we're going to do today. Um, we are going to slow the train down. Anybody feel like the semester is like taking off and you're just like drowning? 
Yeah. Anybody? I mean, that's almost an amen, right? Okay. Um, but what we really, as we reflected on um, this last year, oh, that's interesting, connecting. Hmm, I wonder what that means. Um, we, uh, the preset papers that you have coming for the next two months are going to use a reflective process um, uh, on Osmer, Rick Osmer, which was your reading for this month. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about why do we want you to do this whole reflective thing anyway? And then we're going to introduce you and talk about these four questions from Osmer. And then we're going to practice. I have done a sample preset paper and I'm going to give you the first move and you're going to finish the last three in conversation with each other. Um, and so you get a sense of what we're asking you to do as you move into your preset this next two months. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what we're going to cover today. And then Dave's going to take us into um, the opportunity to do that with scripture. So um, I don't know what that means. Cliff, continue to join the meeting with limited functionality. Okay. Remember my name. Okay. Sure. No, we lost this. We lost the whole thing, I think. Okay. Hang on. <laughs> Is there anybody? Are we on there? Dave? Dave no. Yeah, okay. Dave, so hold on a minute. How's that? <laughs> On the back page. I know where it is, it, and it's in here. It's just not it. Here's, here's what we're going to do while we're waiting. Turn to your neighbor and tell them about your context site, okay, that you just did your learning. Those of you that are in the discovery group, talk about, tell the people that aren't in the discovery group what your group is going to do, okay? Go while I'm getting this back online. <laughs> Yeah, I think we what? Um, it's the internet that went down. It's the internet. We did, we prayed, but we didn't pray over the computer. So can they hear me? Right? I'm going to talk to you to go on. All right, here's what we're here's what I want to do. I want to hear where you've been. Well, they're fixing that. It's an internet connection. So there we go. Ignore the people behind me, right? Um, let's just hear about where some of the sites are. Dave and I have a clue, and Tim have a clue where you are, have been landing, and you're in really interesting places. So let's just give a shout out, and Dave, if you want to also hear that from the online people, that's great. But we're going to talk into the mic so the recording and the people in the cyber world can hear. Um, Eric is going to be Vanna or whatever. <laughs> All right, where, where are some of our places? Come on, you, don't be shy. There we go. Uh, 
Um, Hannah Penabi United Methodist Church has a retreat center yeah. um, out in Western Minnesota, and they have a retired Lutheran pastor doing the programming for the retreat center. So I'll be working with him. Um, so and, you're at a retreat center? Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Doing the helping develop and just kind of learn how they do programming. Um, so cool. they have a couple this month, and then uh, I'll be working with him to do programming and plan for a retreat for bereaved parents in December. Wow. That's cool. Do you have a prior connection to that? Nope. Awesome. So brand new. Yeah. And what program are you in? Um, MA and Christian Ministry. Yeah. So nice connection. Okay. A couple more. Right now. Thank you. Right next to her. So I'm an MDiv student and I am Thank also you. in the little tiny beloved community scholars cohort. Yeah. And through that, mm -hmm. I'm working with Reconciling Works, which ah, yeah. is uh, works towards LGBTQ justice within yeah. the ELCA. And so we focus on providing resources for congregations on like how to welcome and support the LGBTQ community. And that's in a volunteer capacity? She gets a stipend. I, it's a stipend, yeah. Got it. So how many hours are you there? I'm there about 10 hours. Away. Yeah, so a little bit more. That's, that's why it seemed like that was maybe more than just a hanging out. Great. Couple more. Over there. Two. Back to back. I like this. Hi, I'm um, working on two different sites. Okay. Um, on Wednesdays, I'm doing assisting the chaplain in teaching Bible at Union Gospel Mission Men's Campus. Nice. And uh, so I get a approximately because he's going to have me running the big meeting one time, then speaking on one of the chapel services cool. there. Good. And then from my other site is the church I go to. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Bethel Christian Fellowship, um, and I sat down with the assistant pastor last Friday, and he's going to have me start teaching Sunday school to sixth graders, and then every other Sunday, a high school leadership class. What a diversity! Yeah. Sixth grade high school, and then <laughs> gospel mission. <laughs> like, right? That's really, that's really awesome. What program are you in? I'm an MA Bible. Wow, love it. Right in front, right in front of you, right there. I'm Deborah, uh, first year at MDiv, and my church site is Lutheran Church of the Resurrection in Roseville. Oh, yeah. um, I'm the world's best mentor ever. Yeah. Um, they've they've been a great site for us over the they, years. They, they yeah. love having students. Yeah, so they cool. do. It's, it's tremendous. So for me, it's unusual in that it's high church. Um, yeah. and, and I come from a dry congregation pretty informal and so this is a very much a German congregation, um, open RIC and incredibly welcoming and they have Oktoberfest. So my first to do was serving at an Oktoberfest, wow. which was radically Brand different new. for me. Yeah. Um, and then the Saturday I have the opportunity to be assisting minister at a funeral. So oh, already wow. just studying and focusing on worship wow. and sermon prep. Very cool. And Dave, thank you. Look at this interesting, and this is four people. Okay, what do we got online? We have, we have Jill uh, from w Wadena, Minnesota. She's going to be in Wadena. She's going to be working on a community leadership project um, as well as a youth project to encourage high school kids to think more about how they can be Christian public leaders. Nice. And, yeah. And we have somebody doing mental, aid for, uh, mental health first aid yeah. uh, in uh, Bethany. At Bethany, we have a lot of interesting stuff on here. So Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, thanks for doing that. This is a really weird class because you can't just go to the library and say, I'm going to do my assignment between seven and eight on Tuesday night and then check it off your list. Like running down mentors, right? Am I with you? A few of you are like, they're not returning my call or my email or some of you are like, I've been knocking on this ministry's door because I want to be with them and they're not returning it in my timeline and that kind of stuff. But here's what I'm gonna tell you. That annoyance now, or whatever, those making accommodations are gonna pay off. Um, aren't they, Dave? Absolutely. Like, we know what happens usually on the other end. And you're either gonna go, this is really awesome ministry and I ain't called to it, right? You're gonna go, this is not a fit, right, for me. Or you're gonna go, this isn't what I would normally do, but I learned something, right? And, and this is the course where maybe something from your other course is going to resonate in, in something you're doing and go, oh, I get to play with that here. Or I get to 
bring it to my Sunday school kids, or I get to preach on this, or I get to take my pastoral care thing and put it into practice or whatever. Or maybe you're gonna do a project for something that you could you know, use in here. This is that weird intersection kind of thing. Or maybe it's just like what you said, this is a practice I have never seen before. And you just get to go, hmm, I wonder what that is. And to that line, Dave, would you say a, a bit about the discovery group that we talked about just so that they're aware of that? So we realized that um, for some international students coming here to a, you know, to a brand new place, you know, walking into a random church and saying, hi, I'm, I want to be your Christian public leader. <laughs> it's a little bit intimidating. And, so, and I'm still spelling St. Paul, Minnesota. Exactly. So um, braving the cold, all of that stuff. So right. what we decided was um, for, for international students that we would have kind of a, a, an easing in process where they actually get a chance to go and visit sites throughout the Twin Cities for the first semester and to, to figure out, is this a place where I could possibly serve as my CPL site? So it kind of just lessens the burden. So they get to go to all kinds of different sites and see awesome stuff. What all have you seen so far, folks? Seen some cool places? Yeah. And so then- What did you tell us about what that's like? Erica will bring the mic over there. Because I, we, Dave gets to go, I've gotten to go to this. And it is kind of fun to, we have really awesome ministries in the Twin Cities. So just to get to go be a visitor is kind of a fun experience. So one of you guys want to? Okay, I'm John. I'm doing MA in Christian ministry. Awesome, thank you. So far, the few conversations that we have gone around, it's very fascinating. Uh -huh. We have learned a lot. They are very welcoming and they are willing to yeah. listen to us. Cool. And they are willing to share with us. We love the way they worship. It's very enriching than some of us back in Africa. Yeah. So we are here to learn more as time goes by. That's awesome. Thanks. Thank you. They do. It is really fun, aren't, isn't it? Dave gets to call and say, hey, do you want to have some crazy seminarians come and visit you? And they're like, sure. The one I was with last year was at the end of the semester, and it was the last one, and it was a snowstorm. And um, some of, let's just say some of you haven't seen snow yet. And then the students came, and they're like, we're going to church. And, and they're going in the middle, and I came through the snow. And the church was there welcoming them. It was awesome. So we had a fun time. So thank you. And with that, we're back, right? We're back with the ministry. So thank you, Tim. Thank you, Chris. We're all good. Um, so use, think of your sites as a learning, as a really key part of this time. Um, we give you hours as a way to kind of say, this is a kind of the level of commitment. But that doesn't, hours are a hard way to, to deal with that. Um, it's more of, if it might be good to lean a little bit more into if you have an opportunity that you couldn't otherwise have. Um, the great news, I was with a, one of our candidates that is going through the candidacy process in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the ELCA, and she's going looking at her internship and she's gonna be a deacon, which is a word and service person in our, in our um, uh, denomination. And we were talking about internship for her is going to be like a place that you get to be a learner and a leader at the same time. There's very few times you get to step into a ministry and get access to things because, well, I'm a seminary student. Like, I don't know, you say that and they let you do stuff. It's funny, isn't it, right? And you're like, you don't really know. I'm not really equipped to do this, but don't tell them, right? <laughs> or at least do it like, like, well, I'm kind of learning about this, but I'm kind of new at it or something, you know, kind of use that posture. And, and they like, you do stuff, and then you go, that was really awesome, right? And, and I don't know, I could talk about this the whole time, but I think this is the kind of learning that, that you can do the minimum for what we want, and that's awesome. But if there's some opportunities that you maybe couldn't get that really would help you with your leadership or your discernment or something else that you want. Um, one of our students uh, last year, uh, international students that was coming, kind of used that as a jumping off point for some other things because he got in, he just was curious and wanted to learn. So use this as it fits for you and use Dave and Tim and I as conversation partners if you get into places that's like, I don't quite know what to do. Some of you are working and at the CPL site at the same, and those are a little different parameters, but we can help you navigate those as well. All right. 
So thank you for getting your learning agreements done and for starting well, right? A few of you are still working on the final details, but most of you have been in conversation with us, so thanks. Oh, one thing I wanna, I'm just gonna say it now, I was gonna say it later. Um, we had a little problem with, um, we're learning Moodle, those of us on this side, as you are, um, and there were two links that were confusing around learning agreements, and so we turned one of them off, and we're not sure if there was a few things that were in there got pulled over to the other one. And so if it keeps telling you your learning agreement isn't there, just repost it. You're, there's no penalty to you. You're like, I already posted it, but that may have been what happened. All right, there was just a few students that that happened with. All right, thank you. So one of the things that's also different and weird about this class is it's not a content class. A lot of like church history is more than content, but it, a huge part of a church history class or a systematic class is content. What do I mean by that? What do you, what, what, a content class? Yeah. Right, I'll repeat it, thank you. Um, a class where a lot of information is given to you, a lot of new, right? And they want you to get these ideas. There's a set of stuff and that it kind of becomes this core for then you build on. So yesterday the faculty had a, had a pedagogy seminar. We were talking about teaching and learning. And in, in one of the courses that some of you might be in, thinking theologically, they were working with the vocabulary trying to understand what are some basic vocabulary words. Because you know what? We talked weird theology. You can say, I have, I have known the English language all my life and there are like words I have never heard of. And then those of you that English is your second, third, or fifth language are going, what? You know, really? Exactly. I started my PhD program reading with a, a book by my side to make sure I knew exactly what ecclesiology stood for or eschatology or atonement you know, or, you know, those kinds of things. Those are the words, right? So there's content and information, right? Um, what we want to talk about here is our hope for you while you're a student in theological education is you learn the content, but you move from just knowing ideas to understanding them and, and, and growing in the ability of which they can not only saturate you, but come through in your leadership. And this is part of what being a reflective leader. It's first reflecting on experience in light of ideas, right? But it's also reflecting on ideas to, to what I would call building wisdom, right? To, to let you know, learning pastoral imagination is another way, right? The ability that it becomes part of who you are. So one of the things that we found it really helpful to talk about in CPL is how this is a really different kind of class than knowing, right? It's more about some unbuilding some capacity for understanding. So knowing, right, the facts, a body of uh, coherent information, right? So some of you are going to be asked your denominational theology, right? And you're going to have to, in your own words, say this is the body, this is a coherent theology that aligns with the denomination of which I'm going to be a leader in, okay? Um, it has, bear, uh, has certain claims. So one of the things that you're gonna be asked to do is say, I believe that God's Trinitarian, or Jesus died and rose, right? Uh, claims theologically, and then say, and I base my understanding in light of these theologians who's gone before, and these biblical references, and this kind of argument, right? You have to build that out with a whole uh, group of, I call them conversation partners and not just the one sitting next to you. The people that have thought deeply about that, right? Um, knowing tends to have right or wrong. I've got a kid who likes to know, and, and our oldest, and she has a younger sister who's more imaginative and sometimes even lives in an imaginary world, especially when she was younger. And so she would like to have friends that she talked to in the backyard that no one could see. And, you know, she has a good creative imagination. And her sister, who was the knower, right, the, the facts person, would say, that's not right. And on one hand, she was correct. She would say stuff that wasn't factual, right? 
But on the other hand, she had this other world and imagination and maybe it wasn't all wrong either, right? There are times where there is a right and wrong, right? But it's knowing and understanding. Understanding is maybe a little messier than knowing, right? Um, but there's also this sense, I know something to be true. It has validity, it, it's, it's a stable kind of thing, right? Um, so it, knowing also is, so this happens, um, my stomach growls, means I'm hungry, so I eat, right? That I know this happens, I get a call from somebody in the hospital, I know that as a leader, I'm supposed to go visit, right? There's this sense of, I know what to do. I know how things fall. So all kinds of knowing. Does that make sense? And those are all valid. But understanding means, what do those facts mean? So Martin Luther's, you know, so what does this mean? God created the universe and all that exists. So what? So what does that mean for my life? That's a different move, right? Um, Understanding is theory that provides coherence and meaning to facts. It means saying, all right, here's a cluster of facts, but if I put these all together, what does that mean? Right? So you have some theological commitments that you know about God. So what does that mean for understanding of church? If we believe in a grace-filled God and we're filled in law in our practices or the way we see church, maybe there's a disconnect. Right? There's an understanding of how does this translate? How does this seep into our leadership, our way of doing ministry? Right? Um, right and wrong. Understanding is messy. Because understanding takes some facts or some truths, and then it puts them in conversation with people who are a mess. Right? Or who are in process. Who are broken and redeemed, who are the now and not yet church. Anybody heard um, the sense of, um, yeah, if the church is supposed to be, you know, um, this witness to this gracious God, why are people fighting for each other, with each other? And, you know, what, what they're doing with each other isn't reflecting that God. And I want to say, that's exactly right, because we're the exact people that need that grace. And we need to be reminded because in our own nature, we aren't. Craig Van Gelder um, talks about the church as both um, the redeemed people, right? This, we're um, saved by God, right? And we're this human group of people, right? You don't get to get rid of that. It's messy, right? Um, there's also understanding is a matter of degree. Our, we don't ask um, three-year-olds to have the same understanding of God as a 13-year-old, as a 25-year-old, right? But we don't have asked them to do that for anything, right? There's this sense of understanding, and what does understanding who God is at three look like, and what does it look like at 12, and what does it look like? So there's this sense of development or, or, or ongoing stuff. Um, this is the why question, too, right? Okay, that's a, that's a truth. But why is it true? That takes deeper understanding, all right? And understanding is knowing when to do what. Uh, I had a conversation with some students um, earlier this week that talked about, all right, here's really bad theology, at least from their denominational. This person happened to be Lutheran, right? But this is also a pastoral care moment. It was talking about CPE. Some of you know what that is. So they were being a chaplain in a in a ministry and it's like you know at the moment when people are suffering is maybe not the time to throw the orthodox theology card at them right. your husband just died and god had a plan for them and this is all you know gonna like might not be the time to go well maybe god maybe it isn't all planned out ahead of time okay? you know it's not the time to do the theological work it's the time for pastoral care right so it's that sense of understanding, when do I take that and when do I use that? Is any of you good in the kitchen? Here, you gotta be, you gotta know how to cook, no? Right. You just good, you just like to eat. <laughs> yeah, he did, we were talking good foods, right? 
But there's something different than like, I can make mac and cheese by what it says on the box. Right, okay. <laughs> to people that like have the art, the culinary art, and they know when to put this little thing in and this little thing in, and it just, it just like pops. I don't know that you can do that with macaroni and cheese, but I bet somebody could. With lobster. With, oh yeah, they add lobster in that. So there is there is one place here that had like gourmet macaroni and cheese. They had all these different varieties of macaroni and cheese. I don't know, but the, that that's like the art, right? It becomes an art form. What learning pastoral imagination uh, research is about is about that. Learning how to develop the art of leading, not just knowing what good leadership is. Does that? So. Um, so understanding is both a verb and a noun. To understand is to be able to use or apply your knowledge, right? I have an understanding of what it means to be a Christian public leader. Um, and noun, an understanding, is a successful act to grasp the idea, right? I understood how to do that or whatever. So I want to note how this is a complex idea. There are six um, elements here of understanding that I want to I want to highlight and then I have a real cool I have two pictures at the end isn't this exciting so this is what you have to get to look forward to color all right just seeing if you're awake uh, at this time um, so first understanding can you explain can you tell the idea in your own words all right so we asked you to make learning goals based on the outcomes for your degree program, right? So one of the MDivs one is to form and lead Christian community in, uh, in word and sacrament and bold witness to God's mission in the world. It's, that's, it's long, right? But it's one thing to say, I know, I, in my own words, I can tell you what it means to form and lead Christian community, a one word and sacrament, all right? And, and not to just quote Luther, what Luther says in their objective or something like that, right? So in your theology, it may be, I understand my Christology or I understand my view of Christ, how Christ's saving work in the world, right? Um, and then to be able to say it in your own words, not just quote people on, from a book. Okay. Second, can you interpret? Can you make sense of story and arts and data and situations that translate from one medium to another? Right? So some of what this class does is to say, okay, I'm learning this in my Bible class or I'm learning this in one place. Now, how do I do this with the confirmation kids? Or how do I do this in this retreat setting? Or how do I translate this into pastoral care moments? Right? So how can you um, look at it that way? Or how do you flip it around the other side, go into a, a congregation and see their view of God, right? All right, apply knowledge, we talked about that, can contextualize. So not only it, 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 knowing that each ministry context is different, part of the discovery group's goal is to see like, Church in the Twin Cities looks really different depending on where you go, right? There's texture here, there's difference. And like, I'm preaching this weekend at a church, at a congregation I've never been at, and I'm thinking, how do I contextualize that? Especially, I'm thinking, I have to talk about what happened in Las Vegas. How do I say that in a way that makes sense to a people that I have yet met? That's hard, right? But I know something about the congregation, so how do I do that? Can explain, take, oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Season perspective. You can see things from different perspectives. One of the gifts of our precept groups is that you probably have five very different ministry leaders, or at least a couple very. Some might be more similar than you, some might be different. So what is it to put your own perspective to the side for a second? and ask what somebody else might experience. We're gonna really work on this next semester, aren't we, Dave and Tim? Yes. The public nature of Christian public leadership. Um, but the ability to say, ooh, I operate with this assumption. I operate with the assumption that all churches have to have an ordained pastor. Oh, that's really weird, because this congregation doesn't have that. This person, this congregation doesn't even have an MDiv. 
leader, you know, or whatever. That just may be, or there might be, I've always had the assumption that you have to have a church building or whatever. Are you with me? So season perspective demonstrates empathy. The next move beyond that is not only to take in that information, but to say, um, I can appreciate that in a particular way. So it's kind of coming around and, and, and going from that. And that's just a, a little bit more ability to kind of put your own stuff to the side and take in another perspective, right? And then the last one, this is what we're really wanting you to do in your contextual experiences throughout Luther, not just in these two CPL courses, but all of them. And Tim, you can give an amen if I'm right is all of this is a way for you to reflect on yourself and grow and say, here's the, my pitfalls, here's where I'm strong, here's where I can grow. And this is a lifelong journey, is to kind of have self-awareness. Is that? Amen. Okay, thank you. All right. It, um, it, because you guys, here's the deal. I've served in many different settings, and every time I go to a different place or get a new role, I feel like I'm back at zero. I'm like, seriously? Have I not learned anything? And I have. But it's the self-awareness that I get comfortable in my setting. And when I get into a different setting, I get jarred and have to kind of do the work over again. I don't start at the same zero, right? Because I know more things about myself. But you know what? The same traps that I had when I was 25 still can haunt me if I'm not self-aware, right? It doesn't, it doesn't mean they have, they have to, um, to take over for me, but you know, so, so these things are not linear and it's not like a level, right? And so um, you're, you knew stuff before you came and suddenly you sat in a class and you go, I feel like I'm 13 and have no clue, right? I'm sorry, but that's some of what happens in your first semester at Luther. It doesn't matter how, and, and it doesn't mean you're stupid. Can I just say that? It means it's just different. It's just, this is, and it's not, it's not just in the classroom, it's like in the cafeteria and it's in chapel, right? And it's talking to faculty and staff. I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> right? Yes. Okay, Moodle, what is Moodle, <laughs> right? I mean, just all kinds of things. So, so anytime we enter into new places, this, and, but it doesn't mean you're not self-aware of some things already about yourself, right? So this is an ongoing kind of thing. But our, our whole um, engine of CPL is working from knowing to understanding. You know some stuff, you're gonna get some more information, and how do you move from just, I got that, I got, I have Osmer's four questions in me now, I know that. Now how do I use that? as a tool to be a more, a more self-aware leader for the sake of God's work in the world. Not so you pass candidacy or not so you get an A in this class. But so God's work may live in and through you. That's our hope and prayer. And that we know when to get out of the way and let the spirit work in us. And that's the great news is the spirit is at work. Um, so here's, here's another picture. See, two color slides, isn't that exciting? Um, uh, we actually talked about this yesterday in our, in our piece, so, uh, with, t with faculty. So, the first one, explain, remember, can you recall information when you need to, right? Anybody have, like, there's this concept in the Bible and it's in Luke, um, right? Some of you go, you're, you're good with that. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, that's, I got a lot of worrying to do, right? Or do you know enough to Google it or go to a Bible site and find it, right? But it's, can you recall, can you bring information up when you need to, right? This is, this is things like, can you define, recall, repeat, state, memorize, et cetera, right? The next level is, can you understand? Can the student explain the ideas? This was the second one in our understanding thing. Can you describe, <laughs> category, explain, report, paraphrase? Those are kind of things. Um, can you apply it? Can you use the information maybe in a different way than you have before, right? Some of you maybe have done something in education or have an undergrad in another field that you're like, oh wait, I could bring that into my ministry site. Yes, please do, right? 
you know, so, so not only apply it in the particular way, but maybe in a new way. We're using design thinking in our uh, innovation for ministry class. That was not, design thinking was designed for another discipline, but it's now been moved into different places. That's the way of applying. Analyzing, can you distinguish between the parts? In our third CPL class that some of you will take, it's how do you see the system and how do you put yourself in the system and how do you look at the parts and how they're interconnected and how they're different? That's more analyzing, right? Evaluating, can you step back and, and say, we should do this, we shouldn't do this, or even in our work, how do we discern the spirit or not the spirit, right? Those are kind of in that evaluating, in that wondering, and then creating. Can you take this now and make something new? So that's just another way of thinking. We want you to be able to know on all, and to understand on all these levels as you're in, as you're in seminary and beyond. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. All right, so with that, we have found Rick Osmer's Practical Theology Hermeneutical Circle, his four questions on these tasks, to be a really helpful guide. Now I know, well, we use this because it's used in other classes on the theory end. Any of you else have a, a are doing it in other classes? I know Carla Dahl has spoken to me. There, she's using it. Anybody else? Which one? Oh, yeah, pastoral care. Yeah, or congregational care. Okay, awesome. So there's a lot with Osmer, and the whole book is good. We're just having you read the beginning to give you a sense of this. So this is like a tip of the iceberg, and then putting it into your being, getting a chance to play with it. So that's what we're going to do for the rest of today. I want to just introduce the four moves to you and the four questions, and then we're going to um, get to work on it. The descriptive or empirical task. That's when, you, when you're in a setting and you're gathering information, and you're, you're going, I see that, and I wonder what that means. And you start asking questions, and then you go, oh, I wonder if that is the same thing as that, and if there's a pattern here, right? Or... This is a weird episode. This is the first time that that happened, right? Um, it's reading the context. Some of you are get to be with me leading Christian Communities in Mission this fall, or you have it in the J term in spring, or we'll have it at some point. And what we're trying to help you do is get deeper eyes to read the context that you're serving in, to notice things that you in. So the first question is, what is going on? That's gathering data, it's listening to people, it's paying attention, okay? The second move is, is interpreting what's going on. We have accessible to us all kinds of theories and people that have already been looking at this stuff and know stuff, right? And that can say, oh, well, this pattern usually happens because of this, right? So in this third CPL class, we use systems theory. And we say, all right, systems operate this way. And so if you pull this part of the system, this part of the system is going to move or change, right? So um, this is the theoretical angle that we bring in to interpret what we see, okay? The third is the normative or what ought to be going on. This is the theological move. And ought is not this shame thing. But if, but if we bring it, if we look at it through a systematic theology lens, we say, all right, what is it we know about God? And if we know that about God, then what would that mean for this situation? So if we have a God of grace and love and, and care for all people, then what would that concept, that theological concept mean in this setting? Okay. Or we know God's word, scripture says some things for us. How would we bring that into it if we were actually living into what God has called us to be? Okay. And then finally, now that we've thought theoretically and theologically, now what are we going to do? How is our actions going to be informed? I'm here to tell you your actions are theological. The choices you make on... Um, what use the words you use, the way you, you know, if you show up in a room in a pastoral care situation and you demonstrate empathy, if you never open up your mouth or say the word of God, you have been God's presence. 
I rely on that a lot. Do so you ever get in places and you're like, I just don't know what to do or say. But I also know that I can say all the right things and my body can say something else and then it's not helpful, right? So that sense of what does it mean then to do? So I, one of the things that I got to do, I worked in the St. Paul area Synod office and I got to go work with congregations in conflict. Woohoo! right? So one of the things we, you know, try and figure out what's going on. We try to analyze what's going on uh, through theory and theology. And then we had practices. And there were times when I'm like, you guys, we don't know what's going on yet. But here's what we do. I know that God is faithful. I know that God promises to be with us and show up. So let's pray. Let's read God's word and pray. And that's what I had. But that was a theological, pra pragmatic task of saying, we're living into a new reality by what we do. So how might we respond? All right, so those are the four. Now, here's what I want us to do. Um, are we good, Dave, to take about 10 more minutes for this? Okay, um, I have written a practice sample preset paper. It's posted in um, Moodle, okay, in the main course site. But I want you to practice for about five, six minutes with a group of people um, uh, doing these four moves and would say, so I'm gonna give you the first one, I'm gonna set up the scenario, and then you're gonna, in your small little groups, talk about what's some theory or interpretive work that you could add to this that would help you think about it. Second, what's some theological or biblical work that you could ask to say what ought to be going on? And then what would you do? How could you respond in a, in a way that would move this forward. Are you with me? All right, would somebody be willing, can you read this, is it too small or should I read it? I'll read it, because I've, I've written it, so I've heard it before, all right. I, Terry, was teaching the adult form during an education hour between the two Sunday worship services at a congregation when two women in their 80s approached me with a question. I was the visitor in the congregation and did not know either of these women, so I started by asking their names, and then I listened. One of the women began by agreeing with what I talked about. I'm like, yeah, right? She said, you're right. We do want congregations to be intergenerational, and we do have a lot to offer young people. And then the second woman joined in. She said, and you are right. Young people these days spend a lot of time using their technology. And I think they're missing out on an opportunity to talk to each other face to face. And then came the question, how can we get young people to come to church more often? Have you ever heard this question? Somebody? Okay, just, just wondering if you could relate, okay. <laughs> it was a simple question with a complex answer. Having taught adult form several times at this congregation, I was aware that their pastor of 20 plus years had retired just 18 months ago. And now, after a year of being an interim, they had a new pastoral leader. In addition, the last big project that the previous pastor had done was to do a building campaign that included not only constructing a new worship and education facility, but moving them to a new location. Moving to the neighborhood where they were had new single family homes and a senior adult apartments right next to the building. So, so much had changed for this congregation. This community on the edge of a large metropolitan area, it might be the Minneapolis-St. Paul, I'm not sure, um, was in major transition. The small town atmosphere of the, or the small town atmosphere of this town and the intimate family feel of this congregation were things of the past. So before I responded, I thought more about the layers behind the question. That's the scenario, all right? Let's take about five minutes in small groups. Those of you online will be put into small groups. You have to say join when, they, when you get a message and then they will give you a one minute warning before we come back. You need, you we've, can, we've had issues downloading the paper online. Um, they don't need, they shouldn't look at the paper right now. This is just your own, this is just for your own imagination. And then we'll talk about that. Okay, thanks. Go. Yeah. 
So, um, let's just have a couple of those, and then just what? How could that help us take this even further? The the same issues that we've just raised. None of you thought about God at all in here. I don't I find that hard to believe. Sorry. We're gonna to have to work on shyness, right? Do you need more caffeine? What do we need to do, sugar? We could bring sugar next time. Yeah. Okay, I think what I thought and what we discussed in our group is uh, fasting is creating maybe something like uh, Bible study groups huh? in charge. Uh, creating some small prayer groups. When you study Bible, you pray with them. You can create something like uh, social activities. Maybe you go on out to play football, have some games. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, we are able to bond with them and somehow they're gonna open up what the challenge has been. And I think we'll enable them to bring them on track to the church. Um, what I love about that answer is she integrated all of these. So I'm gonna parse it out, right? If let's say it's worship and community is the number two move. The third one is the Bible actually says something about how we should be together. So what if we went to God's word, right? And you could pick several places where this might happen, right? And had people not tell them the Bible says this, right? But says, I wonder what the Bible says about this. Let's read this together, right? And so you're living community while you're engaging God's word in a particular way. And then what would come out of that is we need to pray together or we need social time. Like the action then would flow out of that and bring you back. Do you see? I mean, you just wrote a precept paper. You didn't even know it, right? So nice. Do you, but do you see how I parsed it out? We do this if we've done leadership. But we're asking you to tease out what's the theory, what's the theology, biblical, what's the action, right? Do you got one? All right. Um, yeah, something really great came up in our group, and I'm actually going to put you on the spot, Jen, just because I thought it was super good. I'm sorry. Um, At least I'm you were affirmed for having a really good idea <laughs> first, right? Yeah. OK. Uh, my name's Jen. I'm an MA with the CYF focus. Awesome. Um, and I brought up something that's happened. I have belonged you've, to a church that's you've lived well, this. I've had that question before, okay. for sure. Um, but the church that I belong to in Raleigh, um, we went through a shorter transition, but still a transition and maybe less with moving around. But um, the pastor that came in and started serving with us um, kind of did a, a rethinking of the way we talked about the gifts that we already had. So we kind of talked about this idea of abundance versus scarcity nice. and reframed and took stock of the gifts that we already had in our congregation rather than feeling like we're missing things or right. there's not enough. Um, and in that we were able to form or, you know, allow people in the congregation to form new awesome. ministries to, to those gifts because they saw right. Oh, that person over there that I didn't really know very well has a similar interest or gift that I do, and we can be forming a team to awesome. meet a need that, that is coming up on a regular basis. So the framing theologically from scarcity to abundance and seeing giftedness, a lot of places that's talked about in scripture, turned into different actions, totally different way of leading and being, right? Nice. 
Um, we we had really good a uh, couple of really good ones, but um, we talked about this um, fear. Um, just there's a lot of fear in this conversation, yeah. um, similar to what you said. And so we we talked similar about the theology of abundance um, versus the theology, you know, theology of scarcity, or um, and the theology of the cross. Where does that yeah. come in this as well? That God's showing. <laughs> This is easy and hard. You with me? So what we're asking you to do each, like this really happened to me. And this was just like a blip moment. But I thought, okay, I'm going to put myself in the CPL chair. I'm new to a context. I don't know much about them. I didn't know a lot about this congregation, except I'd done some adult forms when the old pastor was there in the interim, like each fall, I've done one or two. Okay. And so, and I might, yeah, I might hear this again. Right. But this sense of what is a situation in the ministry context that you're in, or for some of you that are in the discovery group, that is kind of right here. You've been in recently, right? that will help you get at the question. So this, this month, you just have to pick a situation. But next month, it's gonna be something about your gifts. It's actually using that, who am I? As you do the strengths and you discover who you are, what's a situation where that gift strengths thing came out and you could sit and, and use, unpack this using the readings or the the ideas that we've talked about, but also other theories, other theology and stuff that you've, that might give insight. Does that, in some ways it's simple, but it so happens all the time that sometimes it can be overwhelming, okay? So what we want you to do this month is just take a situation like this one. Last year, the first time that we did it, oh, one of our CPL students was gonna preach um, literally the weekend after the election. This was her first CPL paper. And she's like, I didn't know what to preach. It was just gonna be the throwaway Sunday, have the CPL person preach. And she's like, ha ha, now I'm preaching. And two of them were supposed to, one of them, the, pe the pastor did it. But this congregation let her do it and she did a great job. But she used that as a way to think about this in a particular way, which was kind of interesting. Right? So I don't know what it is. It, it, it could be a situation that went poorly. It could be a thing that went really well. I use this because I figured people could relate to it and that it's really a, a simple question with a complex answer. Right? So maybe it's something just really ordinary that you use. If you need help with that, let us know, but I think you can do it. And now we're going to get you to practice it in a different way. I'm going to hand it over to Dave. Pass um, the baton to the baton. All right. Well, we're going to uh, crack open the word here. Um, so if you all have uh, a Bible or some form of that, please turn to Luke 24. We need three people who know how to read good. So. We're going to model how to read good. <laughs> who, who would, is there anyone that's willing and able to share? We're going to volunteer people in just a minute. So. Yeah, you understand? Yeah. Now on the same day that two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all of these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while, you're walk while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? He asked them, 
What things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since those things took place. All right, and now if you will imagine, you're gonna to have to use your auditory listening skills um, as Pear reads the next one. Go to the next one here. Okay, now we need somebody with the Bible. Oh, I've got one right here. Here we go. So, can you start on 22? Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. All right, who is our third reader? We have a third reader, Mr. Stanley. Start with 28 to 35. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Oh, continue. Uh, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the, then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Awesome. Thank you. So, so what if you were these women and you were writing your CPL paper um, and having to use Osmer <laughs> um, and thinking about these, these four steps, um, how, would you, how would you approach this? Um, just, and especially that, that third step, that's the biggest one, which we can't see right now, but you all remember the third one? What was it? What ought to happen in light of who God is and in light of the scriptures. So, um, just talk about that third step for a moment. Find a strange person next to you. Take 30 seconds and go. <laughs> Hello? Oh. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? This is a uh, Hi, hi, this is Terry. Is this Micah? No, this is Stephen Lee. I don't know, what do you think? 
we are going to tell that story. Can I clarify? Yes. 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 So remember how Terry said you you take you take this this whole story and you do the interpretive work. So you could you could talk about the women. Um, you could talk about the women's recognition afterwards. <laughs> you could talk about the women's lack of recognition in the moment, um, or you could talk about the whole sweep of it. So we've given you the whole story. Therefore, um, hopefully you can address some of the aspects of the whole story. Does that make sense? <laughs> but death and resurrection. I think that's probably right. Are we back? Okay, they're all coming back online. So, so here's the question. <laughs> Which one are we? Okay, a few more, a few more seconds here. So, what, uh, so here's the thing, this third step is the hardest step, right? And, um, you know, Bishop Eaton calls, uh, and Bishop Eaton is the, is the bishop of the ELCA, and she says it's the wallpaper, right? We, we, we do all these things, we have a great, you know, we're having a great time, we're, you know, we get together in our churches, but this, this theology that guides our actions, it's just kind of there in the background, but it's usually, a lot of times it's not named by people. Um, Pat Kiefer talks about it as using God as a subject of a sentence, right? And a lot of us struggle to actually explicitly name God's activity in the world or in our own lives. So that's what we're trying to get you all to do. And the feedback that we get from precept leaders is a lot of times this is the step that people really struggle with. So we want you to get this third step. That's why we're focusing on this. So, so what all did you figure out? I think that's a good question here from me then. And, and this might be a theological question. I, am, I just want to know what kept the women at the men from recognizing Jesus, number one. Was Jesus in a spiritual form uh, uh, from what he was when he was on earth? So, and right after the bread was broken and he disappeared. So, I want to know, was he in a spiritual form? Because if they knew Jesus before, and here's the man that walking along them and breaking bread with them, what caused them not to recognize him? Anyone else? The online students appreciated that question. Great question. So, thank you. <coughs> Any of us ever struggled to see God in the familiar? 
or the, in my small group online, we talked about um, this is just crazy. Like, how, how are you supposed to respond when somebody dies and, and rises? Like, that's so where the t it went to is maybe what it has to do is to reflect. I would call that spiritual discernment, right? Where is God? What is it, God? This doesn't fit our frame of who we thought God would be or whatever. So that's the work, and we ran out of time, but, but that, that's where we were going, which I thought was a really helpful thing because I don't see God a lot, and I'm sure God's in front of me. Anyone else? Somebody said um, online, I got better at seeing God in CPE. That was one place that that was helpful. Yeah. I thought that was a really good idea. Yeah, absolutely. So this is what we, this is what we're hoping that you all will engage in. What what these women actually did, right? So they had this encounter. They were doing some stuff. They were walking. They were sad, and then it wasn't until they did a little bit of reflective work that they said, maybe that was God that was in our midst, right? And so we want we want you all to get better and better at this. Um, you know what we know what we know about about Jesus. And, and, and about God is that God shows up in the least likely of places. So if you think about um, three visitors coming and visiting Abraham and Sarah, and they're just hanging out, and then all of a sudden it's like, wow, these three people that just came to visit us, that was, that was God in our presence. You know, um, you think about uh, a donkey, <laughs> God showing up in a donkey to speak. Um, you think about God showing up, Jesus showing up in, in a gardener. Right, Mary Magdalene, um, if you know this story, you know, she thinks it's the gardener that's hanging out. Uh, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, Rabboni, wait a minute. This is, this is my guy here. This is my, my teacher. Um, and then in Matthew 25, uh, we, we hear about a, a God showing up in people experiencing homelessness, people experiencing hunger, people experiencing imprisonment or sickness. And so in, in, in my experience, I'll just tell you a quick, quick story about my uh, experience with this. Uh, anybody been on a mission trip? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I came from the early school of missiology, um, which was, okay, here's the deal. We have Jesus. Jesus has never been to the United States, or never been past the United States. Jesus is only in the United States. <laughs> So we're going to bring Jesus to these poor kids in Mexico who surely have never heard of Jesus. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna build something for them that they may or may not want built. And we're gonna <laughs> feel so good about it. And we're gonna, this sounds familiar maybe to some of you. Um, and the dirtier we get, the more we serve God, right? And so there we are and we show up and we're in our nice little buses, our air conditioned buses. We show up to Juarez, Mexico, and we're like, hi. We're here to tell you about Jesus. We're here to serve God. Hey, everyone grab a shovel. You know, so there we are. Serving God, serving God. Middle class white people serving God. <laughs> we're feeling good. We're building houses. We're taking pictures, as many pictures as we can. We're patting ourselves on the back. And the kids are all coming up to us, and they're wanting to hang out with us. And we're just, you know, we're just, like, kicking them off of us, literally. Because there, I mean, there were, like, dozens and dozens of kids who are, like, cramping our style while we're trying to build. And so we're like kicking kids off of us. A little bit messed up. And then we're reading the scripture, Matthew 25. And it says, just as you did it to the least of these sisters and brothers of mine, you did it to me, says the Lord. It's like, wait a minute. Okay. Now, if Jesus was coming up to me and I knew it was Jesus and he was tugging on my leg, I would not kick Jesus off of me, right? Can we all agree that kicking Jesus is bad, right? <laughs> okay, we may have theological differences in this room, but we know that um, kicking Jesus is bad. So, so there I am, serving God, serving God. Little kid coming up, he's, he starts tugging, tugging on my leg. I'm getting ready, you know, Bruce Lee, get, get off me kind of thing. Then I realize I need to walk with this kid. I need to get to know this kid. The work can wait. This house that we were building that was gonna save the world, like, can wait for a few moments. And so I grabbed him by the hand and we started walking. His name was Cesar, he was four years old. 
And he was, uh, you know, he, he was excited because he wanted to show me his house. And the joy that he had in his life, I'm like, you are, I mean, he just had this huge smile. And I'm like, you must have this huge house and you must have, you know, because like joy is, is related to how much you have, right? Those are directly proportionate. And he comes and he shows me his house. And his house is a sunken floor in the dirt. It's about this big. I said, ¿Dónde está la casa? I said, where's your house? He said, aquí estamos. He said, we're here. This is it. This is your house? He said, yeah. He said, you know, um, I don't, a lot of times my brother and I, we don't have enough food. But we, uh, we go to a trash dump here in Juarez. And we always find food because God is good and God provides. And I'm just like, what? And at that point, everything I knew about mission and Jesus and it all flipped. And I was just like, I don't know what to do now. In fact, I just need to hang out with you for the rest of the week. And you need to teach me about Jesus because I apparently don't know a lot. <laughs> so by the end of the week, uh, we became fast friends and it was just a total blessing in my life. And the last day came and, uh, and, and Cesar tried to sneak on the bus because he wanted to come home and he wanted to hang out with us. And, uh, and I was like, you know, I could take you home. I'm, I'm an irresponsible college kid. I could totally adopt you. That's a great idea. It's <laughs> like, nah, I probably shouldn't do that. Um, so anyway, we gave a big hug and he walked off the bus and he starts chasing our bus and just waving and smiling with that big smile. And as we're driving away, I said to myself, I, I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I've seen your face. Don't let me forget your face, Lord. I think for all of us, that's our prayer. Don't let us forget your face, Lord. When we encounter you in places that, you know, as Mother Teresa says, in the most distressing disguises, that's where Jesus shows up, right? Particularly where there's suffering. So if you want to know where to find Jesus, go to that part of the lunchroom that nobody else wants to go to. If you want to find Jesus, go to that part of town that nobody wants to go to. Go to that part of your own family that not even you want to go to. Because you know, those are the crazy ones. I don't want to be with them. That's where you'll find Jesus. And so in this story today, we learn that, that about this, this uh, you know, Deus Abscondidus, you know, this hidden God, that God will show up in the least likely of places. And we know that the least likely place is, is, is on a cross. That, that, that somehow that God would show up dying being tortured on this cross is, is literally the last place you would ever look for God to show up. And that's where God shows up. So that should hopefully, what, that's what, what ought to be going. So what does that mean for us? That means that we have to be looking. We have to be discerning. Where is God going to show up today in my life? What is the failure in my life where God is going to just go into those cracks and, and surprise me with grace? What is that experience who are those human beings that are going to come into my life today in this boring, I don't want to go here today because I'm too tired job. How is that going to become grist for the mill for my own Christian public leadership development? That's what we're trying to get you all to do. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to, is to keep doing that reflective work. Because your hearts, your hearts might be warmed, but you may not know it because it, it, it may, you may be blocked for whatever reason, like I was with Cesar. So how can you ask God to remove the blocks so that you can experience that? Yes, Lavalle. And uh, thank you for that, because for me, I, uh, I I am a traditionalist when it comes to worship. And so uh, one of my first experiences here was I uh, went with uh, my class, uh, my group mate is right here. We had to go to the bar, actually to go oh, see our instructor. And so that shocked me and I'm saying- For my oh, class. <laughs> Say that again? For my class. That's true, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying, this is not right. Why am I going to the bar? But just from listening to you, we have to go where we can find people to save. And if it means going to the bar, it's one of the things we have to do. We have to do it. So uh, that was my experience last week. She took me over and I was like, wow, 
I am coming to a bar. I haven't been to a bar for over 15 years, but here I am looking for something else. So thank you for that story. Jesus can be found to other places, not just in the church. Amen. We also had uh, a lot of comments of appreciation online. So thank you. Well, thanks for listening. Um, so we have five minutes here to talk about learning agreements. Da 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 da. So, um, so this is our friendly moment of law and gospel. So um, some of you all have have found a context. You've gotten your CPL mentor application in. You've received a confirmation email from me. You're good to go. You've done a learning agreement together. Some of you are in various stages of that process. So. Or, or discovery group as well, yes. So, um, so what, what questions do you have about the process? Has everybody been able to locate the learning agreement? You've, we're, we're extending the deadline a little bit, but we're like almost halfway into the semester here. So we gotta, we gotta get moving here. That's my, that's my law speaking here. Um, get, get on it is what I'm saying in a friendly, graceful way. Um, so learning agreements, three to five of them, make them smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time oriented, connect them to your program, to your learning outcomes. You know, there are uh, outcomes for each of your degrees. Take a look at those if you can see how look at the also look at the content of the course and how you might be able to uh, connect with that as well for your goals. So the question online is, should I be waiting for my mentor to make connections to begin my goals or should I just dive in? Um, you know, some people actually will, will start creating those and then, and then that'll be the jumping off point for the conversation with their mentors. So, so yeah. at this point, they should just make the goals so they can exactly. learn from it. Yep. And then the next question was, the biggest hurdle was getting time with the mentor to go over their responsibilities. So any, any insights for that? We always call it holy nagging. You got to learn how to be a nag with mentors. And this is mentee initiated. You are the ones who are dragging them down saying, hey, I need to meet with you. Come on, let's get this going. Um, so so it's, this is a good skill to have that we're building muscle memory here for your ministry career. Um, nag them, get that time together. Um, that's really and, important. And you've said this before, but and you might, once you get in front of them, set times. Exactly. Right? Yes, yeah, set it set set a regular time. You don't have to. I mean, if you have to cancel one, that's okay. But at least you have a rhythm going. Uh, otherwise, you're like, oh, let's just kind of see whenever it happens. That doesn't work. Um, keep it going. Get get both on the dance floor and on the balcony with your mentor. Allow them to both do the reflective stuff about day to day. Oh, I did a Bible study. It bombed. Why did it bomb? But also get get up onto the balcony and say, okay, I, where is God leading me here? Am I really supposed to be in div? Am I supposed to be a man? What is God doing in my life right now? We want you to do both of those with your mentor. So um, who would be able to uh, close us in prayer here? Awesome. Gracious God, we, we thank you for this day. <clears throat> we thank you for the very breath in our bodies and the health that we have, the opportunity to come together to learn, to reflect, to be present with the Holy Spirit guiding us now in prayer. We thank you for this opportunity to go forward to build new relationships with church as church in the world, to be mentored and to mentor others, and to share the light of Christ, whatever our roles are as we discern them. We thank you for this opportunity now, for the learning that's come today, and that will surely come after. May it glorify you. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Have a good weekend. Oh, check out Tyler Sitt, uh, who is from New City. Cole will be participating in worship as well. Um, it's a really awesome new mission start that focuses on environmental justice. He'll be preaching today at, at CPL Thursday in chapel.
I will take a deep breath and feel all of your support. Yes. It'll be awesome. I'm just hoping that I can be able to find the person that wants to hear you. Oh. Nice. Do some, pick the spot you want and think about it. It'll be there. No, it's not right in front of the 